This week, I want us to consider what life looks like when the kingdom of God comes beyond us. Is it possible that who we are and how we relate to God could have an impact beyond us? Because, frankly, sometimes it feels like that's the part that's just impossible. Like, how can this really matter that much? Like, the prayers we pray, I mean, we, we don't have the capacity or the ability to go stop a tank right from crossing the border or coming into a city. We don't get to do that or decide that. Are you with me this morning? So does this prayer really matter in that context? Or, or when we see lost and brokenness in our world that isn't even that of that type or nature, we just see kids that are hurting or, or families that are broken. Maybe that's in our own, our own city or community, and we think, man, but I can't fix that, right? Is there, is there impact beyond us that, that the kingdom can have? Does it matter? Does our approach to life with Christ matter? I know this, we have an assignment. Regardless of what maybe your faith is telling you about that question, here's what I know is so. God gave us an assignment, and it's beyond us. It's bigger than us. Without God, it's impossible for us. And Man, my prayer is that at the end of the day, your faith you know, will have wings. <laughs> I am a purveyor of hope, and I believe in God. But I'll be candid. Sometimes my faith gets fatigued too, and it's challenged. And so, Lord, I pray today. I'm going to pray. God, I pray today you'd help us believe that the kingdom of God and, and the way we relate to you can have an impact beyond us, that you are big enough for the brokenness in our world, near and far. God, I pray you'd help us to understand um, how to live into that and walk that out with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we think about our assignment, when we read this, this verse, when we go back to the prayer we've considered this entire series, the, the word literally, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So what's his will? What is his will? I mean, wouldn't that be the first question? Like if we felt like we were, we were meant to accomplish uh, someone's will or plan, we want to know what their will or plan was, right? Am I right? And the word is pretty specific and direct about why Jesus came. In fact, Jesus himself said in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those right, who are lost. So we say that here at 828 Church. It's not just a mantra or a cliche. It's what we really are trying to live into, that God put us here so that the lost could be found and the found could be free. Amen. Right? And we believe that. And, I, and I, that's an assignment that God has given us. And it certainly relates to our local community. And that's our primary point of impact. I do believe that. But I don't believe it stops there. In fact, Jesus himself said after the resurrection and just before the ascension, I generally quote the uh, Great Commission as we call it from Mark 16, 15. But I'm going to give you the less synoptic version today from Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus said this to his disciples, Therefore go... Hmm and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. So he says to them, go and, and make disciples, help people find their way to me and help them understand how to follow me. See, the lost get found, the found be free, right? To become real followers. And then teach them to do the same thing. Um, what we would say, church family, and if you're new to the family today or if some of this language is beyond you, I'll, I'll, I'll be careful, I hope, to kind of explain along the way, but I'm preaching a very specific message with an intentional target today, and it's us, church. What are we going to do? How are we going to love? How are we going to live? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And, and what God calls us to is to be disciples, right, who make disciples, who make disciples, right? Like the way that we live in following him, it is the apostle Paul, come follow me as I follow Jesus. And that's who we're called to be. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is what God wills for us. And then he said this though, a grand word of encouragement, but don't freak out about this significant assignment because I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I like the old school language on just this one thing, right? Because, um, and we've been using it for the title of the series anyway, so we'll just, let's roll back to King James for a second. Because the King James Version says, Go ye, that's the beginning of this command, and then it ends with lo I. Aren't you glad? Lo I just means, look, I'm with you too. Okay, so go, 
you go and I'll, I'll stay with you. And the go only works because of the with, right? Uh, a first takeaway for us this morning, for his kingdom to come, we have to be willing to go. That's where it started. So the therefore is after Jesus said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. That's Matthew 29, 18. He says, look, I have the authority to say what I'm about to say. Therefore, go. All right. He's calling us, all of us, to go. Now, when I was a kid, I would have been voted the least likely to go. I would have. I, I, I mean, we had who's who at my tiny high school, and I was... I was voted to lead, uh, most likely to succeed. I have no idea why. I don't know what I was supposed to succeed at. But I was voted. But I, I'm sure if there had been a different poll, I would have been voted the least likely to go to leave. But I was determined to follow. Right? So I was, uh, geographically, I was determined to stay where I was from. You can see how that worked out for me. If you don't know me, I presently live, live approximately 1,000 miles from where I grew up. And I've spent very little time there the last 30 years, right? Get to, that's where we go to visit, you know what I'm saying? Because God had a geographical goal for me uh, and for us. But that's not even so much what I'm talking about or what God's talking about when he says, therefore, go. It's not just a geographical go that he's referring to. In fact, another takeaway for us is this. Go isn't just a reference to geographical movement, but a willingness to follow God into whatever he wills. Leave that up for a second because I want it to soak in. I want you to hear me as I, as I pound this point today because I'm going to. That's what I came to do today. Right? This call to go. Therefore, go. But go isn't just a reference to geographical movement. Are you hearing me? but a willingness to follow God into whatever he wills. So he asks us to go make a difference in a lot of different ways. And some of them will leave us very near to home or maybe our present uh, location. And Paul kind of explaining that to the Romans who were new to faith. If you're new to faith, you fit right into this message today. If you have a long history with him, come on, let's step up a little bit. But Paul writing to the Romans said this. He said, so here, I'm going to read from the message. He said, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. And I want you to know when I use the message, it's because I've really nitpicked the original language to make sure that the paraphrase is on point, and it is, just so you know. All right, so I, I frequently leave, read from the English Standard Version. This is a paraphrase, but it is a paraphrase that is on point. And that's what God, through the Apostle Paul, was challenging us to do in Romans 1. Give it all to, to him. Just give it all to him, the everyday part of it. Because sometimes, frankly, it's easier to go for a minute and come right back and do what you've always done. So in as much as we believe very much here at 828 Church in going on mission and Taking trips, just got back from the DR, actually, uh, some of us on Friday. But, but that would be easy to check off a list. Oh, yeah, we went. No, 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 no. Going is 24-7, is 365, and 366 every four years. It's every day getting up and saying, God, what do you will for me today? And not even so much what do you will for me to do, but what do you will for me to be because our being should determine our doing. Come on, somebody. Be a doer of the word. Be who you're made to be and do what matters to God. Whew. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We don't check anything off a list. We follow God into everything that he wills for us all the time. And, and then when we do, man, God shows up, right? Right? But I think the question, though, for us would become, again, and I kind of mentioned it in the beginning, what, but what can, what can we do, really? I mean, in reality, what can we do that's really going to matter? If you look at the overwhelming need, you're likely going to feel helpless and maybe end up motionless, right? So we just look at it and we say, There's, I don't know what to do, so we do nothing. I don't know how to deal with the... the incredible need that exists and that could be someone in your life that's close to you or that could be those things that we look at beyond us poverty and brokenness in our area is significant frankly 
right here in New Hanover County. When we first came to launch a church, and there are lots of churches still launching in the greater Wilmington um, area, and I'm saying all the way to Southern Brunswick County, all the way to Onslow County, I mean, all the way up to Braga and beyond uh, this area, if you will, this southeast North Carolina area, there's significant need all across the board. But when we first came to the area, because there were a lot of launch, church launches, and there still are, people say, well, another church. And I would say, a lot of need. <laughs> Come on in, man. There's plenty to do. There's plenty to do. There's so much need. There's so much brokenness in our city. And, and honestly, and that's not just in the, um, the uh, fiscally impoverished areas. There's brokenness in Riceville Beach, too. There's so much significant need in this area. So many families that have just come apart. So much hurt and so much addiction, so much distress. How do I know I see it? Yeah. We, put, we put a huge word on the outside of our building. It's church. <laughs> and people show up. Both locations, they show up at the door looking for help. You have no idea. Maybe you do. I shouldn't have said that. Maybe you do. But if you don't, trust me when I say there's significant need. You, just, you can Google. You can... You can take statistical analysis and see some of it, but it's more personal than that. We're, talk, we're not talking statistics here. We're talking people with names and faces and families and hearts and destinies. And there's plenty of brokenness right here. And then you step beyond that and look be, beyond that. And, and you look at that and you say, well, is there really... Um, anything we can do. In fact, what you would quickly assess is there are certainly plenty of things we can't do or fix. Frankly, there are lots of things we can't do. Lots of things we can't fix. But there are some things we can do. Are you with me this morning? There are some things we can do. Now, if you are uh, somewhat familiar with God's word, you have a history with the Bible, there may have been a verse even already that popped into your head and you're wanting to quote it to me. You might be wanting to shout it out through the camera, right? Somebody probably said it out loud at South because they as a talkback crowd over there. Y'all give it up right now. Y'all could do a little bit more for me here if you want to, but it's fine. It's fine. I hear you people at South. Hallelujah. But somebody probably just quoted, but Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things. Come on, somebody. I can do all things. Let me change my... Um, Catchphrase. Are we together on it? <laughs> right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Incidentally, uh, that is my wife Karen's like sort of go-to verse. That's been a verse that God has used to speak to her multiple times. And I tell the story sometimes when we first were looking at the southeast North Carolina space as a possible location for planting 828 church. This was back in... Um, the fall of 2012. And we'd come down here, she and I together, and we just spent a little bit of time. We were at a vacation rental in Carolina Beach, and we decided to go for dinner, and we went to El Cazador's on the island for some Mexican food. It's very good. And a big on the wall as we're sitting at the table. We're saying, God, do you want us to be here? Can we do this? Is this a move we can make? And on the wall was Philippians 4.13. The verse is there. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We were recently there with our six-year-old, and she saw it. She said, I think these people believe in Jesus. <laughs> I think they do too. Well, that verse is on point anyway, whatever the case, right? But often, I think, we kind of take the verse out of context. I can do all things. Let's think about what Paul was saying when he said it. Because Paul was just explaining how that he had, man, he had been through all of it circumstantially. There were times, Amy, when he had everything he needed. And there were other times when he was just living in serious uh, temporal lack. Like he was, you know, he had been in prison. He had been beaten. He had also been abundantly blessed. And what he was saying is I've learned how to survive in every situation and keep my contentment. Right, He said that in Philippians 3, but now he's kind of putting a cap on it. And he says, in fact, I can do all things. In other words, anything that God wills for me, I can do and walk through. That's right. That's now are you hearing me? Because he's not saying to Ron, you can, I, I can say, well, I'm going to claim that verse and play in the NBA. I'm going to be the first 5'9", you know, 56-year-old to ever make millions of dollars in the NBA. That's not what God wills for me, and I can't do it. I'll just give it... Give you a little heads up. It's not going to happen. 
all right? And frankly, I can't give a billion dollars because I don't have it. Could God give me a billion to give? Yes, he could, but he hasn't, and I can't. Are you following me right now? I'd like to, there are some things I'd like to fix. I can't, I can't step into a broken relationship and make both parties choose to walk in grace and mercy and follow Jesus. I can't do that. Even Jesus doesn't usurp someone's free will. Are you all hearing what I'm saying this morning? Don't abuse this verse. There are lots of things we can't do, but we can do everything God wills for us to do and everything he calls us to, and we should do that. And there's plenty of good that can be done if we will follow God into what God wills for us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there's an Iranism from way back that I often share in this context, and it's just this. The God who called you is able to do what the God who called you called you to do. Amen. How's your calling going to happen? God's going to make it happen. That's how. The God who called you is able to do what the God who called you called you to do. And trust me, God will call you to do more than you can do. It may not be a billion dollars, right? But he will definitely call you to do things you're not capable of. Don't mishear me on that. He will stretch our faith and he will move us into things. He will call us to do things that are beyond us. And then he will miraculously make it happen. And it's a process. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 117, learn to do good. Somebody say learn. <laughs> hey, that's a journey we're on as a church family. Just seven years old. We're still learning. We're learning how to love in this city. We don't have it all figured out. Good gracious, the, the learning curve is vertical. It has no slope. If it doesn't cause you to be humil uh, humble, you're not paying attention. I mean, what it will cause is humility. When you try to follow God into what God wills for you, you will first find humility. Like, woof, are you for real, Lord? And there's a learning curve. Learn to do good. Work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the orphan. Go to bat for the defenseless. Let's do that. That's in the Word. He told us to do that, so that must be within the scope of what He will make possible through us and for us. Thy kingdom come beyond us. Is it beyond our ability? Sure, but it's not beyond His will for us, and it's something that God will make possible for us and when you look at this last year and we out at this point in the message you're going to see a lot of photos uh, but and thanks to the team for putting so many in. Beth Moody is the best and I know they're going to handle it but man I mean just the fact that we got to invest at South I love what God let us do there come alongside some amazing people and and believe for something big in that community and we're just getting started but there was a lot of man there was a lot of effort that went into that when you consider what God let us do uh, at South and the renovation there, that's a shot from the street feed. But when you, you look, I mean, that was people given basically two and a half months of working on a space. Just pouring their hearts into it. What Was, was it overtly spiritual? Yes. <laughs> Felt mostly physical, but there was a lot in that. Like, Wow walls were being painted, when carpet was torn out, when all the work was done, when, when that was happening, when it was 1 and 2 and 3 in the morning and you're still pounding, you're still working, when you're, when you're putting a pergola on the outside, you're not doing it to be pretty, you're doing it to create reach, right? Because we want people to see and we want people to come and we want people to find hope and find Jesus. Why? Because God called us to it and we can do all things that he calls us to. And it was insurmountable and now a beautiful kid's space with amazing ministry happening week after week after week. That's our world. That's our call. That's our assignment. And God's getting it done because some people said we can. It's amazing to get to see. And man, I love the fact that there's, I mean, people who are willing to go in our city. There's an incredible amount of Homelessness in this United States of America, over 500 million people, or I'm sorry, half a million people. Wow, 500 million, that would be scary. <laughs> 500,000 people that are homeless, about 35% of those end up on the street every night, and there are a litany of reasons people live on the streets. I get that, right? I get it. There are, it's multi-layered. Why people find themselves on the street, they still need to be loved. And I love the fact that our crew does that so well. 
the pictures that were up just a second ago from the street feed, Lisa Kenny and the crew that go out and they work and they serve and they feed. It looks a lot like Jesus. We have programs in, in our church. We, last week I got to be a part of just what you guys do with Nourish on a Thursday night through the Christian Recovery Houses and Gabe and Charlene and Amy and the crew that are here that are such a big part of that. We get to, to be a part of that and our partnership with them is only going to increase, but we're excited about what you do and just believing in you and what you do and how you care and, and the, the fact that we have Hope Life in the house and Greg was speaking a couple of weeks ago and just the effort that these guys are making to love people out of their addiction and into their destiny. Come on, somebody. Are we together on it? Out of their addiction and into their destiny. And we've talked a lot about tides that's in our house that's also doing much the same thing and how beautiful that ministry is. I mean, pregnant mothers who are choosing to keep their babies and love God and go on a journey of healing and restoration. Come on, somebody. There are things we can do. We can't do everything. There's lots we can't do. But this is significant and impactful. And thank God for the way God works through people. This isn't so much us, but them. And maybe we just get to be a tiny part of it, but that we'll be willing to help. And we get to participate in Kids Night Out. I don't think I have a photo, but in Miracle League, one of my favorites. I love coaching the 828 Church Pirates. It's a softball league for people with special needs. And that starts up again in March. And it's year after year of just consistently loving somebody. doesn't matter. It matters to them matters to me matters to it matters to him your kingdom come beyond beyond me and just generous living and giving in this community is incredible incredible the consistency with which someone comes up to me and says hey I got this extra blessing and I'd like to be a blessing with it is there someone in the house that could use the help or hey I have this extra car I think there were Probably at least three cars that got given away in the last month and a half. I can't stand on the stage and tell you all about the details of that. That's right here. as people just generously living and giving. I can keep it. But why would I when I can give it away? What can we do? Well, there's plenty we can't do, but there's plenty. Come on, somebody. Maybe if we focus less on what we can't do and more on what we can do, some good will get done for God. I should have put that in a takeaway. There's always one that sneaks up on me. Galatians 6, 9 through 10, Paul said this. He said, so let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. Oof. I didn't know that was going to hit me like that. We do get tired. The people who are close to me can feel it on me sometimes. I'm just tired. I'm fine, everybody. But Paul gave us some instruction. He said, uh, let's don't allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. How do you, how do you handle that? You run to God. You just get, get with Jesus. Leah likes to say, get at his feet. I, I like to go walking with him and unpack the pain and heaviness and watch him remind me that he carries it and not me let's don't let us allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good at the right time we'll harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit I just pray the spirit of give up would get out of this house in Jesus name that we wouldn't be cynical about what we can't do that we'd be hopeful about what we can do right now therefore Every time we get the chance, let us let us work for the benefit of all. Starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. That's why benevolence is sort of such a big part of the heart of this house. We do a lot. We do a lot benevolently. And the ministry that happens in this house is significant too. And you see it. It's a beautiful thing to get to be a part of. And it was what we're called to. And last night when I was kind of working on finishing up, it was actually late in the afternoon, and I had just gotten to this verse. This is a completely true story. I'd just gotten to this verse, and frankly, I spend not a lot of time on social media. I try to post some things and repost some things in the church, but I'm not dissing on you if you do. I'm just saying I've kind of, it's, it creates a bit too much heaviness for me. Um, 
and I hardly ever look at Facebook inbox because I have almost 5,000 friends and acquaintances, so that's a lot of instant access. <laughs> so if ever I miss an inbox for you, I'm sorry. Talk to someone at the Connections Hub about how to actually connect with me. But there was just a notification of a new inbox yesterday, and I saw it. And I recognized the name as a young lady from Southern Africa. I have some history with. She was a youth, and then she's grown and gotten married and stuff. And she just randomly sent me an inbox, and here's what it said. Hi. You introduced me to Jesus. Forever grateful. I just didn't feel like that could have been an accident because <laughs> I was just grumping my way through putting Galatians 6 9 in this, feeling really fatigued. And I didn't actually do anything. Jesus did everything, just so you know. In fact, just before his ascension, he said in Acts 1.8, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I, I say this often, John, but I love the chronology in that passage. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Listen, if you're going to believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, then you better believe that there's power for what God calls you to. And this is what he calls us to. And you will be my witness. Not might be, could be, or should be, but will be my witnesses. You will rep my heart to others, he says, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea. So Jerusalem is our local. I'll explain this again. Jerusalem is right here. And that's where it starts. Go starts here. Do you hear me? Go starts here. And he said in Judea, which is translocal, that's a little further away. We were a little further away this week. Our flight from Miami to San to Domingo was only two hours. I, I feel like that's Judea for our church family. And Samaria, that means cross some culture. Love some people that aren't the same as you. Maybe they're hurt. Maybe they felt disenfranchised. Go love them anyway. Find a way. And then to the ends of the earth. And I appreciate that he went synoptic on that because there that would have been a long list of places to go. He just said go everywhere, basically, to the ends of the earth. And, and he promised the power to pull that off. But maybe you're sitting here, and again, you're stuck with the can't. But I can't go, for instance. Many of you would know we take consistent trips to southern Africa. That's a long ways. The, the normal team trip lasts 20 days. Not everyone can even get 20 days off. And some people are incredibly intimidated by a 15 and a half, 16 and a half hour airplane flight. And I didn't help last week talking about how, you know, sometimes when I'm 3,000 miles over the ocean, someone said, I was thinking about going until you said that. <laughs> Mess me up. And maybe you're saying, I can't go to Africa. But I would say, but your heart and help can. Maybe you can do. Maybe you're physically supposed to go, but I can't say for sure about that, but your heart and help can. We say here everybody gets to go give and pray. Everybody gets to participate in caring about the, the ends of the earth, and we have amazing partners. Last year we got to help build a church. We'll try to look at some more photos uh, in Protea Park, which in in George, South Africa, and it was incredible that we got to be a part of that. We gave significantly, I think, $10,000 toward the building, and it's a church that's there already. Like Hope Church George is an amazing first world church that's very impactful, but we got to go help build uh, an extension from their main location into an impoverished area. We've gotten to help with the Hope Church Kids building. You see that there which is amazing, and they just broke ground for that. We invested last year, and we're investing again this year. It's going to be absolutely mind-blowing and incredible. That's in western Zambia. That's in an impoverished area. It's going to be one of the most amazing places. We've taken teams consistently to, to plant churches in the bush. This was far off the beaten path in a place called Malikulipe. We 
have already invested and will continue to invest in Village of Hope graduates. There's a school there that, that when the first time we went was just in a discipleship center with a dozen kids, and now it's a school of over 550 first graduating class from the Village of Hope. And many of you scholarshiped some of these students and or will scholarship these students to go to the university and be world changers in Western Zambia. I can't go to Africa. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. And then this year we get to invest in a ministry that we've known about but haven't historically invested in called a night shelter. It's a night shelter in Somerset West in Cape Town, and it's an incredible ministry operated by some friends who once visited us when we were still in Blair. And, and I love the heart that they have. Joe Schwartz oversees this ministry, and there's homelessness at an entirely different level in South Africa. It's like a, a bit of a second world country, so there's a huge third world population and a pretty significant first world and growing population as well that the majority of what you would see if you went would be the first world. But there's a lot of third world intermingled amongst, and there aren't government programs, candidly, that do any significant help. So they will literally drive around and pick people up on cold and rainy nights and bring them to the night shelter and teach them how to live and teach them how to follow. Jesus, it's an incredible ministry and we get to be a part of it. And then just this last week, I'll finish with this on this bit of the vision cast, but just this last week, as I said, we got to go to the Dominican Republic. It was Leah and myself and, and Tim Howard and Tyler. And we got to go to the Dominican Republic and visit our care point there that we operate through Children's Cup. These pictures are from last week and try to discern how we can be a part of blessing people. And that's the child that the Bussert sponsor. We can be a part and we can make a difference. The girl in the pink dress is the young lady that we, we get to sponsor. And her little sister, she was taking such good care of her little sister. But the Care Point Ministry of Children's Cup is incredible, and we get to be a part of that. And it reminded me of a quote from St. Francis Xavier that we used to use quite often, honestly, when we were doing university ministry. But St. Francis Xavier more specifically said to students, uh, give up your small ambitions and follow me to the east. And the paraphrase of that quote is just this, give up your small ambitions and come with me to save the world. And I do think even as Christ followers, we often live with these incredibly small ambitions. Like what we're thinking, what we're believing for, what we're planning is so much less than what God wills for us, what he hopes for us in our world. And maybe you're thinking, but I just don't have enough right now. Like give me a minute, you know what I'm saying? Like I'll get around it. And enough, I don't even know what we're trying to quantify. Are we talking about cash? Are we talking about time? Are we talking about talent? Because they all belong to God. Time, talent, and treasure, it's all his, incidentally. And if you have it, he gave it to you. Amen. And if you'll give it back, he'll give you more. Amen. And I don't have time to teach you through the, the parable of the talents, but I'm just telling you, if you, if you want more, invest what you've got. Because yeah. if you hold it, you'll lose it. But here's what Paul wrote to kind of explain how this works, and I'm going to land this ship with this. David's going to join me on the stage. The worship team here in South should get ready, but don't come up just quite yet. But here's what Paul said. He said, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. Now, again, I said this in the genesis of this, and I said it throughout the covenant series that we did just before. But if you ever mistake anything I'm saying as um, prosperity teaching, then you've just misinterpreted me. Because I do believe God takes care of us. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or beg for bread. But the multiplication I'm talking about is so much more significant than cash. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the way God makes us who we're meant to be. The way God fills our lives with peace and joy regardless of what property we do or don't have. I'm talking about a God who carries us past all that. And he gives some to all sorts of different ministries and gifts that he gives and some are gifted to give and but but the point in this isn't that it's that when god asks you to give your heart and hands and even your cold hard cash to him trust me he'll take care of you that's the point remember this a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop but the one who plants generously a generous crop you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. That's real. A 
I'll come back and read verse 8 in just a second. And that's true. I'm just telling you, when you're, when you're on, uh, when you're walking through the hallway and a kid needs a minute of your time and you take a knee to say hello, that's cheerful giving. Give it cheerfully, not begrudgingly, not, ah, oh, this kid's bugging me. Come on. When there's that call for some friend that needs some help and sometimes a foe, help us, Lord. And you got to pray for a quick minute. <laughs> And I'm not saying don't set boundaries. That's not what I'm trying to communicate either. But when God says to help or do something, do it with a heart that's glad to do it. Whatever that looks like. Because that's where the reward comes in. And he goes on to say, and God, look at this though. God will generously provide all you need. Isn't it funny that when we hoard, we never have enough. Banks can't hold on to the kind of stuff God gives us. There's not an account number here. There's only one in heaven. Are y'all with me? Are we together on it? And God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll ha always have everything you need. And plenty left over to share with others. That's what Paul was talking about when he said, look, I know how to have and not have. Because I can do all things. Come on, worship team. Join me here and at South. Because that's where the miracle of multiplication comes in. And I, I joke, you know, sometimes that it's no secret I don't love math. We did a whole series here once called Do the Math. I actually don't hate math. I probably should more appropriately say, um, you know, that, well, I joked historically math is hard. That will always be true. <laughs> Maybe I should just go with that. <laughs> Math is fascinating. It's important and it's necessary. But at this point in my life, I'm not interested in doing a whole lot of it. But I am so thankful for the multiplication principle. The Word tells us in Genesis that He put the, he put the seed in the fruit. And when you sow the seed, you get a fruit. And guess what's in the next fruit? More seed. He multiplies it. And he'll take the little bit we'll give and do great things with it. It's the five loaves and two fish principle, people. There was still only so much the little boy could eat. But his generosity fed thousands. And he had plenty. He'll always have everything you need. And plenty left over to share with others. Man, that's amazing. And then verse 10, he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed. Ooh, come on, multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. What can we do? There's plenty. So we were just now in the Dominican and we visited this one care point and there was a little boy. We went and did a home visit and there was a little boy there named Carlos and Carlos is in a wheelchair. And they had to ask him earlier, not, not on this particular trip. They've been ministering to him through the care point for a while, which is powerful. And they uh, asked him what his dream was. And his dream was to go to school like the other kids. This is a dream. He can't go. They don't have the ability to have him at school and his wheelchair was an adult wheelchair that if it were here we would throw it away had no rubber left on the rims he's trying to roll it around the bush and he didn't fit in it very well and we prayed for him to be healed and I told God I, I, I pray ridiculous prayers I'm not even sure they're godly I just said God I'd I would never ask for another moment of pain relief if you could just make this little boy walk because we can't. And I'm still hoping for Carlos to walk. I know God does healings on both sides of eternity and he's going to take care of this. But as soon as we turned to walk away, as Leah and I and Tyler were walking away, I said, let's get him a wheelchair because we can do that. And they've looked, they don't have one. We can buy one here. How will we get it there? Somebody will fly back down there and take it to him. 
we're going to buy Carlos a wheelchair. And it's going to have balloon tires. And it's going to fit his tiny little tush. You know what I'm saying? And it's going to be blue. Because he liked blue. It was blue, right? Are y'all hearing me? And I'm completely serious about that, by the way. I'm going to need somebody to be willing to fly to the DR. Because I'm not sure we can ship it. We'll try, but if we can't, we'll just take it. It's not that big a deal. Ricky's got global entry. He can do it. (laughs) You would do it, right? Right. He, He would do it. Of course he would. So I wrote a poem. No surprise, right? (laughs) Leah, why don't you make a plan to come here? Um, So here's our poem for today. It's not what I can't do, but what I can do that I'm responsible for. You simply called me to walk out your will and let you keep the score. I cannot measure my earthly impact from an earthly point of view when I trust and try and do my best. That's when I honor you. And then something miraculous happens. You come and multiply the gifts I give to you and do much more than I could dream to make your will come true. What can I do? I can do what you ask me to and that I will do and pray and give and go and work. Believing you will do the rest to meet the needs beyond my reach. If I will give my best. <laughs>